life science learners, and welcome. I'm sure you guys are glad to be back doing some life sciences. Today we're focusing on DNA and the code of life. This is a topic that you often would have discussed all the way in grade 10, 11, and 12. It forms the fundamental aspect of understanding how cell organization occurs. If you recollect in grade 10, we looked at the cell structure, we looked at the nucleus as being an organic, uh, a structure that produces organic compounds, and then we went into grade 11 and we spoke about how DNA was an important part of how microorganisms carried out their life processes. In grade 12, we focus a lot on the code of life and how all of that process comes together. Fundamentally, DNA forms the basis in which the cells controls its activities. Today, we're going to focus on DNA, we're going to look at its role, and we're going to spend some time trying to understand how this process of controlling cellular activity takes place. So, let's get straight into the lesson. So, have you thought about the following? What information is coded into DNA? And this often becomes a question that we, we kind of query early on in our science years, in terms of what is it that allows for the cell to be able to control what it does? And that is basically the information that's found in DNA. And so we say generally that DNA codes for life. Let's try and unpack that in this lesson. So, in our lesson today, we're going to focus on what are nucleic acids. We're going to spend some time looking at the location of these nucleic acids. Very important to understanding the code of life is the discovery of DNA and what that meant in terms of the understanding of cells and how they control functioning. Very important for us is to look at the structure of DNA. And then we're going to have some time where we're focusing on the formation of the building blocks of DNA as well as the formation of DNA as a molecule of life. So, as we get into every lesson, it's important that we just go through some key words and concepts that we would be discussing. So these are some of the words that we're going to be looking at and terms that we will discuss in our lesson today. So chromatin network, what are chromosomes? The concept of a chromatid is very important. We're going to look at what histone proteins are. Fundamentally important to understanding DNA is the concept of what is a gene, what makes up DNA in terms of the building blocks being recognized as nucleotides, and what are nitrogenous bases found in these nucleotides. Very important would be the types of nucleic acids as well, which are DNA and RNA. I will mention through this lesson context to what mitochondrial DNA is. I might draw some comparisons to RNA. I will talk about the different types of RNA and more importantly, in this lesson, we're going to focus on the process of what is DNA base pairing or complementary base pairing, as well as draw some focus on DNA replication and possibly chromosome mapping. So it's important that we review the cell structure just so that we have context to where we are. And in grade 10, we spend some time looking at the cell. And it's important that we understand that the cell is an organelle, uh, is an is a, is a, part of this organ that actually controls how the cell functions. So again, the nucleus is part of that cell which controls how it functions. So cells have a variety of different organelles and these are little units which carry out important functions and together they work to carry out the cell's function. Each cell can be thought of as a large factory with many little departments having important functions like manufacturing, packaging, shipping, and accounting for the various products that are produced. And so we say that these different organelles represent each other of in this organelle, and they play specific roles in these departments. So a more detailed diagram, and what we want to focus on today is just the area where the nucleus is focused at. So it's important to go back to grade 10 and to look at the structure of the nucleus and we know that we've drawn the nucleus in both the plant and animal cell and it contains basically a double membrane bound structure so you can see that it's got a membrane on the outer side it's got two layers clearly indicated in this diagram it's got a central network of chromatin which is wound up DNA which is present in this 
liquid part of the cell called the nucleoplasm. So the liquid contents of the internal part of the nucleus is called the nucleoplasm. And closely associated with the nucleus is the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a maze of tubes that connect the nucleus to the rest of the cell. Okay, so that's an overview of just the nucleus in the context of the larger part of a cell. If we look at the function and the structure of the nucleus in detail, it's important that we zone in on the structure of the nucleus. And the size of the nucleus may vary. And it, again, because it's a significant organelle, it takes up a large space in the cell. Let's try and understand what its components are. So as I mentioned, the nucleus is a double membrane structure, which you can clearly see here. It contains little pores or nuclear pores, which allow basically for the movement of substances out of the nucleus and into the nucleus. Central to the nucleus is the nucleolus, which is a little structure within the nucleus that controls some of the vital processes inside the nucleus. We know that in this diagram, you can see a shadow of a chromosome, which is the DNA that is arranged in a specific structure. Okay, we know that these nuclear pores play an important role in the exchange and movement of substances in and out of a cell. Let's look further into the structure of the nucleus. As I said, the nucleus contains DNA, which is a form of chromatin, which is essentially the genetic information in a cell. Chromatin can be further compacted into structures called chromosomes. And so we're going to look at what a chromosome is in a little while. The nucleus contains DNA in the form of chromatin, and that chromat chromatin again forms chromosomes, as I mentioned. The nucleus is surrounded by a double envelope or membrane, which contains little pores, and these pores allow for the movement of material in and out of the cell. The nucleus also contains a region called the nucleolus, as I mentioned. So when we look at what a chromosome is, we've got to understand the context of what DNA, how DNA has been packaged into a cell. So it's important that often when we look at the illustrations that represent a chromosome. It's important that you understand that this chromosome that we're looking at is essentially DNA molecules that are wrapped around a central core of histone proteins. And essentially, a chromosome is an arranged pattern of DNA wrapped around structural components called histone proteins to form these compacted structures, which is essentially in preparation for cell division. So, these are thread-like structures that are located inside the nucleus of animal and plant cells. Each chromosome is made up of protein and a single molecule of deoxyribose nucleic acid. So it contains these histone proteins, as you see here, that are wrapped around some structural proteins on the, on the core of this chromosome. The term chromosome comes from the Greek word color, and soma is in reference to the body. And so what is amazing is that when scientists were trying to identify this, they used different stains to be able to make these chromosomes look significantly uh, more distinguished under a microscope. And they found that with the stains that they used, it produced beautiful colors. And hence the term chromosomes was coined. Scientists gave this term, as I said, it's because of the strong stain that some of these dyes were taken into by the DNA. Right. So this is just zooming into the structure of a chromosome. So as I said, that this chromosome, if we unpack that, you can see that it's a wound up structure that is now wrapped around these histone proteins. So DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins into compact structures, which are further then arranged and coiled up into these compacted structures called a chromosome. And so it's important that when we draw and illustrate chromosomes that you understand and have the understanding that that chromosome is made up of essentially DNA. Cool. So that is essentially the chromosome structure that we talk about. And if we try and unpack that, these chromosomes are often best seen in a phase of metaphase in cell division, where it contains two sister chromatids, and I'll explain that in a little while, which are joined together in the center by a centromere. So as an illustration, we often draw the structure in an X-shaped structure. If you look at 
that with the central structure here called a centromere. So this centromere connects one chromatid to the other. And again, as I mentioned, this has got some histone proteins around which the DNA is wrapped. So, so when we talk about a chromosome, it refers to this complex structure where it has two chromatids attached on either side by the central centromere. As I said, the fuzzy arms on the coils are strands of DNA wrapped around support structures called histone proteins. And that specific X-shaped structure is again a representation of a pair of sister chromatids that are attached to the centromere. So we've got in a general cell in, in our body, which is a somatic cell, we have 23 pairs of these chromosomes. So when we refer to a pair of chromosomes, we refer to this as one chromosome and that as its pair. And these are similar in shape and size. So we refer to that as a homologous pair. And again, remember that if one of these chromosomes are inherited from the sperm and the other from the egg. And hence, we have a pair for each one of these in all our body cells except the sperms and the eggs. The sister chromatids are clones of each other formed during DNA replication in preparation of cell division. Essentially what that statement refers to is that this arm is an exact copy of that. And that's because in preparation for cell division, these arms would undergo copying and be a replica of each other. And so we refer to those sister chromatids as being clones of each other. So guys, at this point, we need to reflect on what we've looked at. We've looked at the structure of a chromosome, something that we've been introduced to as a concept in understanding what cells, what the nucleus contains. But if we unpack that structure, we know that that chromosome contains the nucleic acid, which is a focus of what codes and controls how a cell functions. So let's try and understand what are the different types of nucleic acids and try and understand how DNA plays an important role in the coding of cell function. So when we talk about nucleic acids, we're referring to, if you recollect, in grades 10, we mentioned organic compounds. And these are organic compounds because these are molecules that are produced in the body. So they're produced through some process, a biological process. They contain carbon, they contain hydrogen, and they have these pento sugars that we refer to, which makes it essentially an organic compound. Okay? And they control the synthesis and proteins in all of, of proteins in all living cells by storing and transferring genetic information to the rest of the cell. There are two main types of nucleic acids when we talk of nucleic acids in a cell. We've heard the term DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and we have RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. A very quick overview of a comparison between the two is that DNA, if you look at it, is a helical structure, and you can clearly see that. And what do I mean by helical? It's double-stranded, so you can see that it's a strand that's wrapped around with a complementary strand. So it is not spiral. It contains two strands, as you would see, that are wrapped and twisted into a ladder-like molecule. What that essentially means is if you had a ladder and if you were able to twist this ladder, you would be able to climb up that ladder in a helical pathway. And that is essentially what a helix is. So you've got two sets of struts that you can hold on to. And that is essentially what a DNA molecule rep is indicated as. If we compare that to RNA, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, can be twisted, but it is not helical. And so we will discuss the structure of both in detail in a little while. It's important that we understand where DNA is found. And the location of DNA is important to understanding what's its significance in the context of where it's found. Based on that, DNA can be located in various parts of the cell, not exclusively to the nucleus, but in other organelles as well. So, DNA occurs mainly in the nucleus, where it forms part of the chromatin network, as we've just seen, and thus it is known as chromosomal DNA. And because it's in the nucleus, we say it's nuclear DNA or chromosomal DNA these forms, those chromosomes that we see in the nucleoplasm. 
However, there is a small amount of DNA that occurs outside the nucleus, and that is called mitochondrion, uh, mitochondrial DNA, which occurs in the mitochondria of cells. It's also found in the chloroplast of plant cells, and it is known as chloroplast DNA. Both of these, the mitochondrial DNA and the chloroplast DNA, are known as extracellular DNA. Again, referring to the extra nuclear DNA found outside the nucleus. Right, so that's a wrap for this segment, guys. We're going to take a little break, and when we get back, we're going to look at the structure of DNA and how that is important to understanding how DNA replication occurs. So a short break, little stretch, grab some water, and see you in a little while. Welcome back, life science learners. We're going to continue with DNA, and just a recap of what we've looked at in the earlier segment. So we've looked at essentially what the nucleus was, what it contained. We looked at the different types of nucleic acids. In this segment, we're going to focus on the structure of DNA, and we're going to try and understand what was the discovery of DNA and when this happened, and some important people that led to us understanding the structure of DNA today as we know it. So let's get straight into it and try and unpack what is this DNA molecule made up of, and what does it actually mean for us to know what DNA has been in terms of its discovery? So let's get straight into that. So in this segment, we said we're going to focus on the structure of DNA. So I'm going to explain some concepts as we get into this and try and unpack that. So DNA is a polynucleotide. And if guys, if we try and break this word up, poly means many. And nucleotide refers to essentially a building block of DNA. So DNA is a molecule that is made up of many smaller building blocks called nucleotides. So poly meaning many, and nucleotides referring to smaller building blocks. So when we look at comparisons to other organic compounds, if you go back to our organic compounds in, 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 in chemistry of life, we know that we've got carbohydrates, and we say that we've got polysaccharides. And so these are organic compounds that are made up of many saccharides. Now we're looking at a polynucleotide. So it's made up of many smaller building blocks called nucleotides. So essentially, this concept tells us what are the building blocks of DNA called? And these building blocks we refer to as nucleotides. Another term for building block um, is monomers. So the monomers of DNA are called nucleotides. Let's get back into it. So a polynucleotide is a very large molecule made up of a string of repeating smaller units called nucleotides. And it, this essentially refers to the monomers. The single smallest building blocks of DNA are called monomers. In this case, they are nucleotides. Each DNA nucleotide consists of three parts, and let's try and understand what these are first before we look at a diagrammatic representation of them. It contains one deoxyribo sugar molecule, it contains one phosphate group, and it contains one nitrogen containing base. And so these three components make up one single DNA nucleotide. Let's try and unpack that in a diagrammatic representation. So as I said, it contains a single sugar molecule. In this case, we often draw it as a pentagon because it is a five carbon sugar, and we refer to that as a pentose sugar, unlike your glucose, which is a hexo sugar. Here we've got DNA, which contains a pentose sugar, which is a five carbon sugar. It has a phosphate group, as well as it has nitrogenous bases. And that is essentially the three components that make up a single nucleotide. And as I mentioned that a nucleotide refers to the simplest building block of DNA. Let's move on. When we look at the structure of these nucleotides, it's important that we recognize that there are four possible bases that can form part of a nucleotide. And these nitrogenous bases, which we refer to sometimes as bases, are adenine, and we often use the symbol capital A to represent that, thymine, we use the letter capital T to represent that, guanine, capital G, 
as well as cytosine with a capital C. So let's try and recap that. So these nitrogenous bases that we see in the DNA molecule, which I've represented here, these, they could be four possible nitrogenous bases. And so they are represented either as a T, a G, a C, or even an A. So that's essentially what we refer to as when we talk about the nitrogen bases. However, when we look at this, there are five different nitrogenous bases that belong to two main groups. Okay? The two main groups that we talk about, that these families are, are the purine bases and the pyrimidine bases. So these five different nitrogen bases, which I'm going to illustrate in the next slide. So we've got adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These, and in, in addition to that, uracil, belong to two major groups. Let's try and look at the next slide. So as I said, one of the families of groups are called the purine groups. And in the purine groups, we find that these are double ring structures, as you can see here. These nitrogen bases basically contain two rings, and these are essentially found in DNA. So we call them your guanine purine bases, and they found both in DNA and RNA, and this is often represented as G. And the other individual or member of the purine base family is adenine, and we represent that as A. And this is found both in DNA and RNA nucleotides as well. The other family that we refer to are your pyrimidine bases. And I often try and focus on the Y in pyrimidine, and that often helps me to remember that the two that are in this group are cytosine and thymine. And these are found, your C are found in DNA and RNA, and your thymine is found in DNA only. In addition to that, we've got uracil, which is a type of um, nitrogen space, which is found exclusively in RNA. And these pyrimidine bases are your single ring structures, as you would have seen here. These are all composed of a single ring structure. So guys, we get to the next concept of complementary base pairs. Now let's try and understand the context of what complementary base pairing means for DNA. Now the term complementary goes back to even our understanding of how the lock and key mechanism of enzymes work, where you have a specific shape of an enzyme and a substrate that's unique. And these complement each other in a unique way. Likewise, we've got to apply that understanding to the nature of complementary base pairing in DNA. Now holding that thought that complementary means that there's a unique base pairing between two bases, we need to apply that concept to understanding what complementary base pairing is in the context of the structure of DNA. So let's unpack that. So these base pairs of nitrogenous bases always pair up in a similar complementary pattern. This is specific and is referred to as complementary base pairs. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to give you a chance to look at what I mean by this. Essentially, your complementary base pairing refers to the following, that in a base pair, Adenine will always pair up with thymine, and likewise, cytosine will pair up only with guanine. Now, let's try and understand that in the context of a diagram. Now, guys, here's obviously the chemical structure showing you complementary base pairs. What I need you to understand is that, yes, this is important in terms of understanding the complexity behind the chemical structure of adenine, but more especially than that, it's for us to understand that in any complementary base pair, which we see here, there's always a purine and a pyrimidine base pair connected together. And you will see that there's a double ring structure here on your adenine and your single ring structure in your thymine. And this base pairing is unique and will only take place between adenine and thymine. And likewise, we see the group pair of cytosine and guanine being combined together in this unique pair, where you have three pair bonds that hold them together in this complementary, unique base pairing. Right, so let's try and unpack a more complex structure of DNA. Now, 
I'm going to refer to DNA as being firstly a double helical structure. All right, what does that mean? So on this side of the board, I've indicated to you a twisted helical structure. Let's try and unpack that, unwind that, and illustrate that as a ladder-like molecule. This is what I'm illustrating in this image, and let's try and understand this. So if we step back and if we look at it, DNA is a double helical structure. Helical, as we understand, in terms of this model. It's double because it, it has two strands. On the one end, you see a sugar phosphate backbone. On the other end, you find a sugar phosphate backbone. So this is the one strand that we refer to, and this is the other strand we refer to. And both of these strands are held together by what we refer to as hydrogen bonds in between. So each of these strands are made up of nucleotides. And as I mentioned, that DNA contains these unique building blocks called nucleotides, which has three parts. It's got a phosphate, a sugar molecule, as well as a nitrogen base. And if you look at this model that represents the double helical structure, we see that there is always a base pair between adenine and thymine, or adenine and thymine the other way, and always only between guanine and cytosine, as we see in there. What this model also represents is that there is a unique complementary shape between the adenine and the thymine, which allows only the adenine to fit in with the thymine and not with the cytosine, because these shapes do not complement each other. And so this is more a representation of the complementary shape between an adenine and a thymine. So if we try and unpack this model again, so I'm going to very quickly go back to what the structure of DNA is. DNA is made up of nucleotides. It's a polymer. So it's a polynucleotide. And that essentially refers to, if we're looking at it, it's made up of many of these nucleotide molecules. It contains complementary base pairs, as we've indicated here, where cytosine and guanine base pair together, or we have adenine and thymine base pairing. It contains a sugar phosphate backbone, which is on either end, and you can see that made up of these phosphate and sugar molecules that are connected to each other. And this is a polymer, meaning it's made up of many, many of these monomers. So again, a very busy diagram for us to be able to unpack. So let's summarize that with a few key points. So as I mentioned, DNA is a double-stranded polymer made up of nucleotides. Each strand is called a polynucleotide chain. Again, the concept of being made up of many nucleotides. Each polynucleotide chain may contain millions of nucleotide units. So that strand that we looked at contains many nucleotides. It is in the form of a double helix, the shape of which is maintained by the hydrogen bonds between the organic bases. If we go back to this image, I've pointed out that these base pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds. And it is that hydrogen bond that holds the structure together. DNA contains four types of nitrogen bases, and these are your adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Each strand is linked to the other strand by complementary base pairing of your organic bases. As I mentioned, that cytosine will always base pair with guanine, so C and G will always base pair together, and your adenine and thymine will always base pair in that complementary nature together. So that's the structure of DNA. We've looked at the formation of a nucleotide. We've tried to understand what the formation of DNA is. And the next bit that we're going to focus on is the discovery of DNA. Guys, it's important that we understand that DNA wasn't discovered overnight. There was a process. And as with any scientific discovery, there's often pioneers in research that try and find an investigative question and try and dig further into it. And so we all know that Watson and Creek were recognized with, I, with coming up with the DNA double helical model structure and received the Nobel Prize for that. However, this took many years of work by many scientists from much earlier on. 
And so let's try and understand the timeline behind this and what does it mean to be able to put scientific rigor and years of research to come up to what we currently find as the discovery of DNA. So the discovery of DNA started very early in 1875 and it went on till actually 2003 with more significant progress in the recent years around DNA and its application. And so Frederick Meischer was who identified the DNA. Very early, he had did some simple experiments to try and identify DNA. This table talks about essentially the timeline. And I'm not gonna spend too much of time looking at this, but it's important that there's some really significant experiments that were conducted. So Erwin Chaga, he played a very important role in determining that there was always equal numbers of adenine and thymine bases, as well as equal numbers of cytosine and guanine bases. We're gonna spend some time looking at some key discoveries in the structure of DNA. Notable is Franklin's uh, and Maurice Wilkins' contribution to this. So Franklin was working on crystallizing DNA and X-raying this DNA. So she had perfected the technique of being able to crystallize DNA and X-ray these. And so she was X-raying these and photographing the structure of DNA on photographs that she was collecting. She had the understanding of what DNA composed of, the chemical components, but there was very little understanding of what the structural molecule of this was. So they were trying to busy put together the, the, the model of DNA and what it would look like as a complex polynucleotide. So she had subjected a crystallized structure of DNA into, uh, through X-ray beams and that produced you know, a display of diffraction images of light as it passed through. And this was photographed and created as an X-ray image. Um, and these were significant in her contribution to uh, the discovery of DNA that Watson and Creek later on used, okay? We also know that, you know, this was significant to the discovery of DNA. These X-ray beams produced diffraction images, and that was what was important in understanding the scattering patterns of the, the DNA molecule. And so what she discovered that DNA was a double-stranded molecule. Later on, she produced an image called Image 51, a famous image that, that was shared with Watson and Creek, and they used this image to put together with their calculations and findings what their model would look like. Francis Creek and James Watson were the significant contributors who were recognized with discovering the structure of DNA, and so they used a process of trial and error with a whole lot of other calculations that they put together along with the image that I just showed you now. And Watson and Crick were able to assemble a model of what DNA looked like. And they mentioned that DNA was a double-stranded molecule. It contained two strands that were anti-parallel. It was made up of complementary base pairs. And using that information, they put together this image and this model that we see here. And this model was recognized as the most appropriate and correct scientific display of the DNA structure. And these two gentlemen were recognized for their contribution to discovering the DNA molecule for the Nobel Prize. Sadly, Rosalind Franklin had passed on before this Nobel Prize was, was awarded to Francis Creek and Watson. Um, and only after a little, a few years had gone where she recognized as a significant contributor to this discovery. And so guys, in this session, we've looked at the history behind it. It's fascinating to understand what goes into discovering DNA. When we get back, we're gonna try and understand some application questions around this. I think you guys have done well. We need a little break before we get into the last segment. Welcome back, Life Science Learners, to our final segment for today. Let's look at a recap of what we've done today, and we get into our final segment looking at some application of what we've had to go through and look at how we understand how to un unpack the concepts behind the structure of DNA. So we've spent some time looking at what are nucleic acids and where they are found. We've looked at, just recently in the last segment, we've looked at 
the discovery of DNA. We now know the structure of DNA, and if we were to explain that, you should be able to understand what the concepts of what a nucleotide is and how DNA is formed. So we've looked at, essentially, the structure of DNA. We, if we were to wrap that up, we would say it's a double helical structure. It's made up of two strands, and each strand is attached to each other in the middle by complementary base pairs, and that these complementary base pairs are made up of purine and pyrimidine bases, and we know that adenine being a nitrogenous base, base pairs with thymine, and likewise cytosine with guanine. So we've looked at that structure. We've understood that it's a polynucleotide made up of these single, small building blocks. Now let's use all of that and try and apply that to understanding and how that is tested in the context of different questions. So the first question, the table shows the percentage of composition of bases in DNA of cattle and an octopus. We've got to then use your knowledge of the structure of DNA to calculate the missing values of A and B in the table. Fill in the answers into the table. So I've got the table on the next page. I'm going to very quickly go to that table and we can go back to the question. So here's a table that shows you the different organisms. So we've got a cattle and we've got octopus. And it essentially illustrates the percentage, and this is a percentage illustration of the composition of the different um, bases in DNA. And so here we're seeing that the table illustrates a 29% composition of adenine for the cattle, and it has also, for the octopus, it shows you a 33% composition of thymine. So uh, I'd like to go back to the question, guys, so that we can read the question again and have a better understanding to that. So use your knowledge of the structure of DNA, and we've got to calculate the missing values of A and B in the table. Now, guys, it's important that the, the question points us to using the structure of DNA to calculate. Now, let's look at this. What's important for us is that we know that in this table that adenine has been given to us. So if we look at the cattle, the percentage of adenine is illustrated as 29%. If we look at the octopus, and that's given to us here, where we see that thymine is indicated as a percentage of 33%. Now, guys, it's important that we pause at this point. And using our understanding of the complementary base pairs, let's try and link the rationale for solving this up. So if we've got DNA that's made up of complementary base pairs, and they've given to us a percentage of adenine, Knowing that adenine and thymine are always proportionately equal, we can use that information to help us answer this question. So if DNA contains, for example, 20% adenine, it would mean that they would need to be 20% thymine. And that's purely from our understanding of the structure of DNA, that adenine and thymine are always complementary to each other. And this rule comes from Chagoff's rule, where he talks about when he extracted DNA, he found that no matter which species of organism it was, when he extracted DNA, he found that the composition of adenine and thymine were proportionately equal, and likewise, the, the composition of cytosine and guanine were proportionately equal. Using that rule, we can now figure out the percentages of these missing bases. Let's try that. I hope you've got your calculator. You're going to be able to help me with that. So, if we look at adenine, if adenine is 29% for cattle, it means that thymine also is 29%. And guys, if you can help me here, if we can add these up, so 29 plus 29 would give you the total percentage of what adenine plus thymine is. And so if you do your maths on this, so that's already, that equals to 58%. So 58% of the DNA is made up of adenine and thymine. Knowing that this is a percentage, it means that the balance of the percentage, so 100 minus 58, should give you what's left over. And so the leftover of bases, or what's remaining, is your cytosine and thymine. So 100 minus 58 is equal to 42. And if we try and unpack that, it means that the balance, which is guanine, plus cytosine 
equals to 42. This would mean that because guanine and cytosine are always equal, we would need to distribute that equally between the two. So we would divide that, and it would mean that each guanine and cytosine now contain or um, constitute 21% of that. So we've worked out that adenine makes up, and we said, let's look at that, 29%. So that would be thymine would be 29%. And if we looked at guanine and cytosine, they would make up the balance of the 21%. And if we now were to apply the same rationale for looking at the octopus, we know that the octopus contains 33% of thymine, and we can quickly enter this on the table that there's a balance of 33% or proportionately equal amount that adenine is made up of. If we don't add that up, we get 66%. So if we add 33 plus 33 is 66. And so it would mean that Collectively, these two, guanine and cytosine, have 100 subtract 66. Sorry, 66. And we divide that by 2, and we can very quickly do that. So 100 minus 66 is 44. Am I right? 34, my bad. And if we divide that by 2, it gives us a percentage of 17% in each one of these. So it means that. You've got to now use the rationale that adenine and thymine are equal proportionately and that guanine and cytosine make up the proportion of the other bases. So collectively, A plus T plus G plus C collectively equal to 100 and use that to be able to work out the distribution proportionately between the complementary base pairs. So quite an easy question which often comes up uh, which you should be able to apply. Let's go into some terminology in terms of that we've just gone through in this segment. Give the correct biological terms for the following. And as I mentioned, the terms are crucial to understanding biology and life sciences. The base that pairs with thymine. Guys, this is easy. So we know that adenine and thymine always base pair together. So the base that pairs with thymine would be your adenine base pair. The next question, B. The building blocks of proteins. And guys, we've discussed that the building blocks of DNA are called nucleotides. And as we get into the next segments, it's important that we understand what are the building blocks of proteins as well. And so this, this is an extension question, and this refers to segments of amino acids that make up protein. So we know that amino acids put together form proteins, or the monomers of proteins are called amino acids. Let's look at C. The bonds that hold the two polynucleotide strands of DNA molecules together. So we said that DNA is double-stranded and it has these complementary base pairs. And it is, they are held together in the middle by what we refer to as your hydrogen bonds. So we've got your hydrogen bonds that hold these complementary base pairs together. And so it's our hydrogen bonds that hold them together. D. Repeating units are monomers that form a nucleic acid. So the repeating monomers of nucleic acids are called nucleotides. So the DNA is made up of nucleotides, and we know that we've got RNA nucleotides and DNA nucleotides that produce different types of nucleic acids. Let's look at E, sugar that forms part of DNA. And in our image earlier on, I referred to that pentose sugar, and that pentose sugar that forms DNA is called a deoxyribose sugar. So it's a deoxyribose sugar. The shape of DNA molecule is the next question, and as I mentioned, the DNA is a double helical structure, so DNA has a, is a helical structure, or in some cases you can refer to that as being a helix. So it's helical, it forms a helix. Let's move on to the next question, folks. The figure represents a part of a nucleic acid molecule. Study the diagram and answer the questions that follow. So let's move on to the figure. So here we're seeing a figure that shows you part of a DNA molecule. Let's try and study this figure and answer the questions that follow. Again, this is a very schematic representation of DNA, and you can see that 
It has two strands, and I'm not going to scribble on this yet. So you've got the one strand here, and you have the other strand, which is on the other end. We've got some structures that are labeled, and these clearly indicate a specific shape, as you would see. And these shapes are unique in that you can see that only this structure, number four, can connect with number three. And so that uniqueness is based on the complementary base pairing. Important to this diagram is a key that is given. And this key rep indicates that adenine is represented using the letter A and cytosine using the letter C. So in this diagram, we can see that adenine is here and it's identified with this specific shape here, which I'm pointing to now. We know that cytosine has been labeled and cytosine has been identified with that unique shape. So using our principles of complementary base pair, we know that adenine will always base pair with a thymine. So this complementary nitrogenous base on the other end is going to be a thymine. And likewise, cytosine base pairs with guanine, and hence that number five is going to be a guanine base. So guys, using the shape of A, we can help use that to help us figure out what the base for number four and three are. So based on the shape, knowing that adenine has a unique arrow pointed shape, we can use that to draw inference that number four would also be an adenine. And likewise, based on that, we know that number six, which we identified as thymine, will be also indicative of what number three would be. So based on that, we've now used that information to figure out that number four would be adenine and number three would be thymine. And so guys, as we wrap this section up, it's important that we try and link back to where we started. Identify the nucleic acid shown in the figure, and we know that this nucleic acid, again, is DNA, and the reasons would be that, firstly, DNA is a double-stranded structure. We can see that it contains two strands. And more importantly, we've just identified that it contains a thymine base. And that's unique to only DNA. And DNA contains thymine. And using that, we're able to identify and link our understanding of the uniqueness of DNA is that it's double-stranded and it contains a thymine nitrogenous base. Guys, you've done well. We've gone through the segment looking at the application of the structure of DNA. In, in our lesson today, we've looked at DNA as a molecule that codes for life. We've tried to unpack what the structure of DNA is, and we've tried to understand how we can use that information, especially about complementary base pairing, to work out the composition of nucleotides in a DNA molecule. So guys, you've done well. Go well, keep safe, and looking forward to seeing you soon.